Okay, so I know that some of you have MATLAB questions. So MATLAB questions should be directed to So if you have MATLAB questions or simulink questions, you should send an email to Johnny at tang.481 at osu.edu and he'll be able to reply to your MATLAB questions. If you have theory questions, you come to me. I can answer all the theory questions or conceptual questions. But for any errors that you find in simulink or something you don't understand in simulink, he will be in a better position to answer those questions. Okay, yeah, no, okay. Uh, so we were talking about dynamic watermarking. And this was a picture that we should have in mind. This is the plant. which gives xt, there is an attacker which gives yt, this goes to the controller which outputs ut and then that ut goes into the plant. And what we were discussing in the previous class, this is all stuff recap from the previous class. So under the no attack case, yt equals to xt. Under the attack case, yt is not equal to xt. And the hypothesis test that we set up in the previous class was y1 a u1 yt ut follows yt plus 1 equals to f of yt ut wt and the alternate hypothesis is this does not follow the following dynamics. Oh, ut is equal to uh, gamma of yt. Gamma is the policy. So I pick a policy, so the, the idea here is uh, you have a policy gamma and based on the policy gamma you are generating a sequence of observations at the controller and remember that the controller knows y1, u1, yt, y2, u2 all the way up to yt, ut and all it has to check is whether this uh, whether the, that, that sequence of observations you are making or the sequence of uh, random variables that you are seeing follows this dynamics or not. Okay, that's all it has to check. Now there is a problem here and the problem is if the controller acts deterministically, which means that it has a deterministic map of yt, ut is a deterministic map of yt, 
it is very easy for the attacker to fool the controller okay so what the controller needs to do is add some randomization device so it has to pick a randomized policy because what is going to happen is the attacker would not know what actual UT went into the system because attacker knows gamma, attacker knows the policy, but the attacker doesn't know the realization, UT, that is being sent to the plant. Okay? So this is exactly what was done in the dynamic watermarking for the LTI system where you had a uh, you had a usual policy plus a Gaussian noise, and that Gaussian noise was added to force a correlation between the observation and the action when there is no attacker. Okay, so in this case, as well, we want to use a randomized policy, and what we will have is, let's say your gamma star is the original control policy, you will pick gamma to be beta, no, 1 minus beta gamma star plus beta gamma watermark, where gamma watermark is a randomized policy. And beta is the strength of the watermark. So we discussed that in the previous class, randomized policy. Do, do you have your notes? Yeah. So it was randomized policy gamma WM that maps the state. It maps the state X to a probability measures over U such that, no, probability measure over, well, let me write it in a slightly different way. Gamma watermark of xt is a probability measure over u of xt. So this is the set of admissible actions at the state xt and you are mapping uh, the watermark policy is a randomized policy so at every xt it gives you a probability distribution over all possible actions that you can take at that particular state. And in that situation, it will pick one of the, one of the action with some, some uh, by using a coin toss. So it will toss a coin, and based on the outcome, it will pick one of the actions that are available. The other thing that I had mentioned in the previous class was if you take a convex combination of two randomized policy, you get a randomized policy. So, so this gamma is actually a randomized policy because you're taking a deterministic policy, which is a trivial randomized policy with a truly randomized policy, which will have some probability distribution over action set. Here both are convex. Sorry? Here both are convex, right? Well, technically you can view this policy, yeah, you can view them as a convex set. Uh, uh, it's a complicated concept, but yes, you can view it as a, con as a convex set. Yeah. The set of randomized policies forms a convex set in the set of all policies. Okay, so if you remember, uh, in the case of watermarking with Gaussian, uh, Gaussian uh, random vector, the strength or the the variance of the Gaussian random vector was small. Sigma E was very small in the case of, let me, let me remind you. So for the LTI system, your gamma of x hat t was k of x hat t plus E t, where E t was a Gaussian vector. And the magnitude of the E t or the covariance of E t was actually very small because it was a small watermark. 
And the covariance of ET is the same as the strength of watermark beta that we are using here. So somehow that beta and the strength of uh, the covariance of ET are very similar concepts in the two different problems that we have studied. Okay, so you can increase the strength of watermark by increasing the value of beta, or you can reduce the strength of watermark by reducing the value of beta. For the paper that we wrote on this subject, we picked beta equals to 0 0.5, sorry, 0 0.05, so that's a small value of beta. But you could take beta equals to 0 0.01, or you could take it 0 0.1 depending on how quickly you want to detect the attack. So, uh, can be from this frequency or like, uh, beta can be Sorry? So beta how, can be? How can we determine the value of beta? Trial and error. Whatever is your mean time, whatever are your constraints on the mean time between false alarm and mean delay. Okay. So, suppose you want your mean delay to be small then you want to pick a large value of beta. But then you are not really controlling, you are just randomly changing the control signal. Uh, it's not really useful. What's the point? So if I'm randomly pumping cold air into this room, we are not really controlling the system, right? We are just doing some random thing. We are just playing around with the room. So that's why typically the strength of the watermark has to be small but you still need a reasonable number so that you can detect an attack very quickly. So that's the trade-off you're looking at. Okay. All right, so here is the situation. I have a system. Uh, I have the usual control policy. This is the control policy that people have used in the last 20 years for that control system. So I come in as a cybersecurity person in that particular meeting, and I say, hey, look, I'm going to pick a small beta, and I'm going to pick some randomized policy, whatever that policy may be. And I'm going to pick a randomized policy, and I'm going to take this convex combination. This is my new policy. I'm going to go to the PLC or microcontroller, and I'm going to write a code which will implement that policy. And I'm going to override the controller with the new policy that I've come up with. So the new policy is old policy multiplied by 1 minus beta plus some beta times some watermark policy. And then the controller is going to send this UT signal to the plant and you know we'll have this closed loop system. And now we have set up the hypothesis test. Uh, using this particular, like the uh, usual hypothesis, null hypothesis, and alternate hypothesis. Now the question is, how do we test the hypothesis, okay? So the algorithm for testing the hypothesis is given in this handout that I've shared with all of you, and it's also uploaded. The full paper, this is part of the paper that we have written, where we developed this algorithm. So the full paper is uploaded to your, to your Carmen handout files. Like in the file section, go to the handout, folder and you will find the full paper uh, uploaded there. So this is just one printout which contains the test statistics and uh, uh, some uh, results on mean delay and mean time between false alarms that we proved. So I'm going to talk about the test statistics now, but before that, are there any questions on this? Is everyone clear on how to implement a randomized policies in a control system. What would a randomized policy for this uh, temperature control for this room look like? Anyone has some thoughts on that? Like what you said, we're trying to some code, yeah, change the control policy for turbid so and monitor the output and test the signature of this water mark. Right. Are you asking about like how we can create the signature for this? Correct, correct, for this room. So I'm talking about, you have the air conditioning system somewhere in the, 
air handling unit somewhere in the room which controls how much cold air is pumped into this room. <coughs> and you have a temperature sensor here and I'm the attacker and I'm going to just press my hand on the temperature sensor. So now it starts reading my, my body temperature rather than the temperature of this room. So and your que qu question is how do you detect it? So we can introduce like, we can add a watermark like. Where will you add the watermark? Right, so that's YT, that's the data that is going into the controller. Where is the controller? The controller will be somewhere in the building, some, some room in the building which will have all the PLCs controlling the air handling unit. So there is a controller somewhere in the building where all this data goes, and then what are you going to do there? So, uh, so with this input data, I will add some watermark with particular strength. Yeah, but that's what I'm, I'm asking. What is the, what do you mean by watermark in the context of this room? So maybe I'll end up add some randomized signal that will increase and decrease the uh, temperature, maybe? No, not the temperature. What is the controller controlling? The flow, okay. Cooling uh, of the yeah. How much cold air gets pumped into the room? There is a damper or air handling unit which opens or closes yeah. and that uh, figures out like that, that decides how much cold air like 300 cubic feet per minute or 500 cubic feet per minute, that amount of cold air is going into yeah. the room. So that's gamma. Right, yeah. that's gamma WM. So what you will do is based on the temperature of the room, you will figure out, so let's say 300, 300 cubic feet per minute is what the usual gamma star is based on the existing logic. You will go in and you will increase it or decrease it by five cubic feet per minute. That's a small watermark, right? So you will, at, at this, in this next five seconds, it will be 305 cubic feet per minute. In the next five seconds, you will be, it'll be 295 cubic feet per minute and then you will change it to 310 cubic feet per minute, right? So you will have a random number generator in your PLC, and that's going to figure out what this additional watermark is supposed to be. Yeah, so it will figure out in this way, like whenever the cold air, we input more cold air. Yes, then you expect the temperature to go down. Yeah, some temperature here should go down, right. but if it is not going down, exactly. then... Perfect, that's exactly what the test statistics is supposed to be, right? So you, you pumped 310 cubic feet per minute of cold air and for this particular minute, so you expect the temperature to go down by a certain degrees Fahrenheit, but it didn't go down by certain degrees Fahrenheit. Then it means that there is an attacker which is tampering with the temperature sensor, right? So that's the watermarking scheme that we are talking about here. Uh, in the case of cruise control, like the, suppose you want to detect whether the steering has been hacked or not, so you are driving on the road, this is the lane. This is your lane and this is your vehicle. And you are going to put some small amount of, so your state will be how far you are from the center of the lane. So this is the center of the lane and this is your uh, center of gravity of the vehicle. And, and this is your state of the system, like how far you are from the center of the lane, that's your state XT. And what you are going to do is, you will add a watermark signal. So based on the, how far you are from the lane, you will either steer left or you will steer right, right? So those are the two options available to you and how much, how much steering are you going to put? So that's this randomized policy gamma WM. So you'll pick some randomized policy and you will pick some strength of the watermark and then you will keep moving the steering and if the car is moving in an appropriate fashion then everything is working fine. If it is not then there is a problem. Yes? Uh, you get the randomized policy from the same P of A. Sorry? The P of A. Uh, we define the same set uh, from which have to get the randomized policy. So this policy you're talking about, where do you get this policy from? No, we define the set from which you have to take the randomized policy, the P of A. 
this one p of so the there is a change in the notation the the paper is using a for action and we are using u for action oh we said a or u oh can you check yeah a a with the set of uh, right but uh, a was just a set of probability a was just a discrete set yeah but the actual set was u of xt no, Right. So we need to select a randomized policy from the safe control region. Right. So this is the safe control region. So how do you determine the set of safe controls? So this is something that's supposed to be given to you. It depends on the physics. So in the case of lane marking on the road, unless you want to move to other lane, there will be a zone. Uh, sorry, it looks like a vehicle. But uh, I don't want it to look like a vehicle. Basically, if you are in this region, if your center of gravity is in within this region, then you are fine. If not, then, then you have a problem. So you don't want to be driving the vehicle like this. That's a problem, right? Uh, same thing here. So there is a region around the center of the lane where it's okay to drive your vehicle, even if it is like slightly away from the center. So that's the safe zone. That's U of xt. And it really depends on the velocity of the vehicle as well. So you don't want to steer too much at very high velocity. So you want your steering angle to be very small. But at small velocities, you can, you can steer much higher. So that's where the safe control, that, depends, that really depends on the actual problem that you are you're solving. It, it's, if you look at an engine and how much fuel should get injected into the engine, it really depends on a lot of factors, like what the engine temperature is, how much oxygen and fuel mixture is. So, Again, it, those maps are available with the manufacturers, and you have to stay within constraints. You, you can't really do whatever the heck you want to do. And yeah. Like this is frequently happening each time step, right? It's happening each time step. All the time. All the time. The time step is your definition. You can define whether it's microsecond or whether it's one minute. So for the case of this building, mm -hmm. it would be better if it is one minute uh, because even if you pump cold air, it's not going to just cool down right away. It's going to take one minute for it to show on the temperature sensor. So you want your time step to be sufficiently long so that you can see the effect of your action on the, through your sensors. It doesn't have to match the original policy. Okay? It doesn't have to match. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So a lot of this thing. So remember, one thing that you should know is these things have not been productized yet. Productized means that there is a mathematical theory that goes into an actual product. My hope is you guys will productize it in individual domains wherever you go. It could be a chemical plant. It could be an oil and natural gas plant. It could be an actual vehicle. So when you productize it, that's when all this knowledge will come in as to what the time step should be, how should we pick the time step, how should we pick the watermark. You know, right now it's all theory, but hopefully some of you will get to work on it in the future and you can productize this, this sort of schemes that we are discussing in the class. So my, my uh, interactions with Ford uh, has been that they are looking into these policies for their next generation of vehicles. Because these are not just for detecting attacks, but you can also detect anomalies within the vehicle. And, and you know, your check engine light will go on and then you will go to the dealership and get things fixed. So they are looking into these kind of policies for, for detecting anomalies and detecting attacks on their vehicles. Any other question? Okay. No, I, I want to erase this slide. So now I'm going to write the test statistics. So what's the test statistics here? So I'm going to define n 
k to n l prime given l comma j to be equal to summation t equals to k to n delta l prime given l j y t t plus 1 u t. So what is this delta uh, notation? Delta l prime given l comma j y t t plus 1 a t equals to 1 if y t plus 1 equals to l prime y t equals to l u t equals to j 0 otherwise. <coughs> Then I'm going to define nk to n l comma j. This is summation l prime in x <coughs> n l prime given l comma j. Okay, so this is counting between time k to n. How many times have I seen the sequence of L j L prime? So L j is the current state action pair, L prime is the next state. So how many times have I seen this pair? This is what it is counting. And then n k to n L j is just summation over L prime in x. So you look at all the, for all the states, how many times L j pair has appeared. Then you come up with, from here, you compute q hat k to n l prime given l j, which is n k to n this is my empirical transition kernel. Then the test statistics S k to n would be summation t equals k to n minus 1 log of q hat y t plus 1 given y t u t over p y t plus 1 given y t u t.
OK. So this is the true, this is the true uh, transition kernel. And as is always the case, if you know how the state transitions, you have the transition kernel available to you. For the queuing example, you had this transition kernel available to you. I, I think that was part of the question. You had to come up with this transition kernel. You had to compute it. And then max k less than n minus capital M s k to n greater than equal to tau attack less than tau no attack. That's the that's how you test the hypothesis. N? N, N? Oh, M is the time window. So M, M, M is greater than zero, and it's the time window. So this time window is needed to compute the Q hat. So you need like enough time window. You can't start detecting attack as soon as the attack starts. You need like a time window to collect the data. And that's what this M signifies. OK, so let's see how this uh, algorithm works. So you pick a time window m strictly greater than 0. Um, so that, that's the data for the past m time steps that you have collected. And what you are trying to do is you are trying to come up with the empirical transition kernel. This is the empirical transition kernel based on the data that you have collected over the past m time steps or m or greater time steps. So you get the transition, empirical transition kernel based on the existing data set. You have the true transition kernel because you know the model of the system, so you know the true transition kernel. Sometimes you don't even know the model of the system, but you can estimate the true transition kernel by collecting enough data under the situation when there was no attack on the system whatsoever. Okay. So suppose today, or in the month of November, the building was not under, this, under any kind of cyber attack. You have the data set collected for the month of November, and you have estimated the true transition kernel based on that data. Now in December, you look at a time window of length m. Let's say this time window, this m was two hours. So you collect the data for the two hours in a moving horizon. And you estimate this Q hat, which is the empirical transition kernel. And then you compute this uh, SK to N by using the log of log likelihood, log of the empirical kernel divided by the true transition kernel, uh, which was, and this part was estimated from previous month or the month of November. And then you raise an alarm if this max of SKN is greater than tau, and no, don't raise an alarm if it is less than tau. Okay, and as always, you have to pick the tau, pick this tau thing appropriately, so that, uh, so that you don't raise too many false alarms. Okay, so this is another active attack detection scheme using what is known as dynamic watermarking. 
So that ends our discussion on dynamic watermarking. This is the, this is the current uh, state of the art, so to say, because, uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there are other uh, possible extensions to the dynamic watermarking for like nonlinear systems and all, but those are pretty complicated schemes. So I am not going to cover that in the class, but if you are interested, I can definitely refer you to appropriate papers where those schemes are given and the corresponding uh, experimental results are provided. Yeah. Yeah. This is the number of times you have seen L, J, L prime in your data set. Okay. And, and like in the second step, we have No, this is just uh, defining this. So this is where. So I'm just defining this particular delta function that I'm, used, I'm using here. This is known as indicator function. Delta is typically used as an indicator function in, in uh, some probability literature. So I'm just using delta as an indicator function here. Okay. So, so there we are looking for uh, LJ and L prime correct. values correct. over a period of time. Over a period of time. That time is M or larger. Then this is our. Uh, this is the total number of times you have seen LJ in your data set. Okay. This is the total number of times you have seen LJ L prime in your data set. This is the total number of times you have seen LJ in the data set. Okay, so there are three data, like different data sets. That no, it's the same data set. This is this is summation of this number over all L prime. Okay. okay? There we got our empirical transition kernel. Correct. And then we are performing log test. Correct. Then you are computing the log likelihood ratio yeah. with the sum. And then you are, this is your test statistics. Okay. So is that, is that happening all the time, like online? Correct. Correct. The time window, like as soon as this time window finishes, you stop again immediately with the same time window or you can like implement that every let's say your time window is two hours but you can implement this in the morning and one time in the evening you know what I mean right How, those are all, all the time every two hours right so those are so the theory says every time every two hours you yeah. do this yeah. in practice you will have to make some assumptions and considerations and you will have to productize this algorithm and then we will know what you learned from your experience. And of course, your experience will be restricted to the domain in which you are working, which could be a chemical plant, which could be an autonomous vehicle. OK? My hunch is, my, my professional opinion is that by 2040, you will see this kind of algorithm everywhere in the world. Like, you, you know, it will be there in your thermostats, it will be there in your vehicles, because this is the best detection scheme currently in the market, not just for cyber attacks, but also for anomaly detection. So if your sensors have failed, if your actuators have failed, some version of this algorithm will be running in your day-to-day -day systems for detecting various kinds of problems within the system. Okay, so this is the state of the art. I mean, I'm not saying this exact algorithm, but dynamic watermarking is the state of the art. And uh, my feeling is that's what is going to be used across various industries in the future. Okay. Now let me tell you what the problem with dynamic watermarking is and why this will not be used across the industries in the future. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I have to give you both sides of the coin, right? Uh, okay, so what's the problem with dynamic watermarking algorithm? Well, you see you are com 
computing this empirical transition kernel based on the data. And if you take any probability course, you will realize that getting a good estimate of Q hat is very, very difficult. In a class of systems that do not converge to equilibrium very fast. Okay? So it's a very good estimate for systems where the equilibrium is reached very quickly. It's not a good algorithm for systems where the equilibrium takes a long time to reach. So, so what should we do in those cases, right? So that's one, one reason why this algorithm may not really work in all the cases. Now let, let's look at some other example, which is also a very important example. So we have this electric grid, and within the Ohio region, there would be, let's say, 100 electric substations. So there are some substations providing uh, electricity to Columbus, some substations in Dayton, sub -sub substations in Toledo, and so on and so forth, right? So they, it's, a, it's a large state. It will have 100 substations. Each of those substations are measuring the voltage, the current, the phase angle, and all that stuff for the electrical system. And so they are collecting every 100 milliseconds. They are collecting data which would be of the order of R1000. Okay, so your XT is in R1000. It's a complex system. It's a complex system, and your actions, UT, is kind of decentralized. Decentralized in the sense that UT, so generators are generating some electricity, consumers like I can turn off the light, I can turn on the projector, and so on. So I'm changing the total amount of electricity that is getting that is flowing through the system. So UT is also very high dimensional, R1000. So if you have like such high dimensional states and actions, you can imagine that this is going to take like a million years to converge, okay? So it's not really a good scheme in, in these situations. This is the electricity grid problem. And T to T plus one is 100 milliseconds. So within one second, you have collected a thousand cross 10 dimensional data within one second, okay? That's the amount of data you are collecting in the Ohio region. And so you can multiply it by the entire United States and you have like very, very large amount of data getting collected every second. So even though you are collecting a lot of data, you don't really com control enough number of, so who, 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 who is you? So you could have AP who wants to detect whether there is an attack going on or not. You could have independent system operators who are detecting and whether an attack is going on or not. There could be generators who are detecting whether there is an attack going on or not. And each of them have very little control over the entire system because the entire system is actually very, very big. So now the question is, how do you detect an attack? Or how do you come up with a detection scheme for these class of, this class of problem? Which is a very large system. I, I, so, so far I've talked about, you know, trying to detect an attack on your steering system. You control the entire system, right? So you can detect. Or whether something is happening within this room or not. Again, you control the entire system, you can detect. Now I'm talking about really large scale infrastructure a large power plant, or a large uh, electric grid, or a large uh, oil and natural gas plant where there are lots of chemical processes going on simultaneously. And the question is, when you are collecting so much of data, does it even make sense to create these matrices which could be very, very large? And perhaps uh, you, you will never be able to compute those matrices. So what can we do in these situations? Okay, that's the question. Would dividing them into sub situations help? Dividing them into subsystems, that can probably help. So just like the university is a big, big like for 500 buildings, but we are only looking for attack within this enclosed space. But the fact we can look at attack within this enclosed space is because the Buildings, other buildings, do not really affect the control system within this building. 
So it's not tightly coupled. It's not a tightly coupled system. This is a very tightly coupled system. You know, what happens at that generator versus, uh, and what happens with AP Ohio and what happens with transformers affect everything that's happening within the system. You see what I'm saying? So it's a very tightly coupled system, so you can't really isolate a small part and look into that part. So you are saying that you will look at the safe region? Like the subsystem example. Uh -huh. I make sure that every subsystem operates in, a, uh, in the safe region. Which is exactly how things are working right now. So every subsystem in the electric grid is working within the safe region, which is why the whole grid is working. Right? But when you are under attack, that may no longer be the case. So some part is going into unsafe region. And there are, of course, inbuilt mechanisms in place. So for instance, uh, suppose a large generator, let's say there is a nuclear power plant somewhere in Ohio, and something happens to that nuclear power plant. Okay, It's not unheard of, right? So Fukushima reactor, it, it, a tsunami came and the re entire reactor melted down within a few minutes. <clears throat> what would happen in that situation? What would the electricity grid do? They will shut off powers to different regions within the state so that the supply is equal to demand. So if, if one gigawatt of uh, generation goes down, they will curtail one gigawatt of demand. So they'll, they'll, they'll shut off power supply to the entire Columbus region. I mean, that would be bad, but uh, they will shut off, say, some other city or some other locality, they'll shut off the entire electricity supply to those regions, and that's how they will stabilize the grid within a matter of few milliseconds or within a matter of a few seconds. That's how the fail-safe region works at this point of time. And, and I think what you are saying is if everybody is safe, then it's fine. The problem is that when the attack happens, some of the things may not necessarily be safe. Or you may think that it is safe, but in reality, it's not safe, right? Any other thoughts? So basically, when safe region is attacked, it will affect the, uh, the system that is coupled with the attack system? So I could attack a generator, but I could feed you information that the system is working just fine. So there is no supply of electricity, but somehow your, your information gathering system is, is getting the information that everything is fine, but there are still problems that you're seeing in the system. So your computer interface says something else and the reality is something else. How do you, so, uh, so that's where you have to detect that something has gone wrong. And what has gone wrong, right? So that's what we are trying to do. Like right now, we, our focus is just on detection, not on response. The response part, we'll get to it in a bit. But the goal is to figure out the detection part. Actually, it turns out I'm out of time. So I'll talk about principal component analysis in the next class. And I'll talk about some very simple attack detection schemes under those situations uh, for, for this, this class of problems. So. We'll talk about it in the next class. Thank you.